Hi, so in the last video, we talked about culture and work ethic and how work ethic it cannot be separated from the economic system of a country. And when you're discussing economic systems, what you're really talking about is a banking system that gives you or does not give you the ability to, to save money in a way that's viable, in a way that makes saving uh, something that makes sense. We also talked about how the banking system cannot be separated from the insurance system because in, in any system, whether it's a financial eco ecosystem or some other ecosystem, people will make mistakes. And the question is whether or not you can recover from those mistakes. That's really what insurance is. It's the ability to allow people to recover from mistakes. Uh, whether it's, you know, a bubble of some sort, whether it's excessive loans, um, natural, natural disasters of some sort, and so on and so forth. So we talked about all those other things. And, you know, we also didn't quite touch upon a couple of issues. One of them was just the fact that travel is, is fun, in part because of these different cultures. You notice when Europeans travel to Southeast Asia or other countries, or other areas, they oftentimes say, especially the Germans, uh, you know, in books and so on, that they really appreciate how people are able to appreciate living in the moment. And so when we talk about culture, remember that this idea of people being more free spirited in other countries, especially in developing countries, may also be a product of the economic ecosystem that actually prevents them from being able to think long term financially. And because finance is such a huge part of any culture, you know, it obviously will impact behavior. So you don't want to make the mistake of thinking that this is some, somehow ingrained, this free spiritedness is somehow ingrained in any culture. In many cases, it's a direct byproduct of an economic system, which, which is itself a byproduct of the strength of the banking system, which itself is linked to the strength and the integrity of the insurance system. And we also can't separate colonial behavior, post-World War II, and, and of course, before then as well. And, you know, you have to look at the financial system. And when you look at the financial system, you, you understand, you know, even Egypt, I mentioned, was, is still on the pound. That tells you they were colonized at some point by the British. You look at Singapore. Singapore uses the dollar. They speak English. That tells you, at some point, they were colonized by the Americans and the British, or at least occupied by them at some point. Um, you know, just because you have a, oh, of course, the Philippines has the peso, that tells you they were colonized by Spain at some point. So, you know, this, this doesn't, it doesn't mean necessarily that just because you have another country's currency name, that you're, you're somehow worse off. Or, you know, that if you happen to be independent enough to create your own name, uh, that you're somehow successful as a result without anything more. And it turns out that, say, Indonesia has its own currency name called the Rupiah. And I don't think that, you know, obviously the Dutch, when the Dutch left, they took a lot of their money with them. And, you know, you wouldn't necessarily call the Indonesian banking system today uh, an extremely stable sector. Although you certainly could say that they've learned from their mistakes and they're hoping not to replicate that capital flight that occurred before. And, you know, the other thing you realize when you're traveling is, you know, names change, right? Well, why do they change? You know, Bombay, when I was growing up, it was Bombay, India, not Mumbai. And you have to understand that one of the reasons things change is because you're trying to signal a break from the colonial past, which is inescapable whenever you study history, modern history. So we've talked about all these other things. Um, and we've talked about how important finance is when evaluating culture. One thing we haven't talked about with respect to the work ethic, and this would be the follow-up, is the presence of charity. So one of the problems is 
that charity, charitable organizations that receive tax write-offs, one of the problems is that it's very difficult to evaluate the true uh, cost or value of a donation. Let's say somebody buys a piece of artwork for $25,000 and then five years later, uh, you know, says the artwork is worth a million dollars, donates it somewhere, and then that charitable organization, whether domestically or overseas, goes to a bank and then borrows money against that million dollar asset. Very difficult if you're a tax auditing agency to come in and argue that this thing that is subjective inherently is not worth what you say it is. And that's an easy, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a straightforward example. In reality, all you have to do if you want to have fraud and money laundering directly involved within donations is simply to inflate the cost. So let's say Tim Tebow, a philanthropist who's also a former NFL quarterback and I believe now a baseball player, he wants to open up a facility, some sort of facility building in the Philippines. And I'm not alleging that, that any of these people actually know what's happening. In many cases, just like Donald Trump, they're licensing their name. They're relying on a team of people to get things done for them. And so getting back to the example, you know, Tim Tebow happens to be a charitable person. He donates a portion of his paycheck. He's told his team is told it's going to cost $10,000 to build this building with six beds that will handle something like childcare or medical issues within the local population. And, you know, as far as, there's no way for his team, which is, for the most part is domestic, is not, you know, you're not dealing with foreign exp you know, policy experts or for foreign wage experts. There's no way to know whether this building is gonna cost $5,000 or even $2,000. You would have to have the kind of intelligence operation that a philanthropist typically doesn't have. And so you can see very quickly that Tim Tebow cuts a check for $10,000. Whoever the intermediary is pays the construction crew $2,000 and then has $8,000 left over. Maybe even has a continuing commitment. And as far as the Tebow organization is concerned, nothing's problematic here. It's not that big of a check. But in many cases, these the construction companies are, you know, it's Tebow's charitable organization gets a tax write-off. Tebow pays less taxes as a result of donating money and so on and so forth. And again, there's no way to really, you know, it doesn't seem like there's any, anyone here is being harmed, right? Except for maybe whoever the, the government receiving that should have received more taxes. Um, and even then that's a hard argument to make because, you know, you're, you're contributing overseas in a way that on its face is, is, is benevolent. And you're doing something that the government wouldn't do. And in light of the colonial history uh, with MacArthur and so on, you know, in light of all that, you know, it's also something that may seem justified. But it turns out that you know, charitable organizations are like corporations, in many cases linked to a larger structure. And if you're doing money laundering, you have to accept the fact that, you know, some sort of mafia organization is going to be involved at some point. And that's where it gets tricky. Because all these economic numbers that we talk about, they rely on integrity and honesty and transparency. You know, when you get these numbers, they don't typically include a very large black market, an underground market, or what Hernando de Soto calls the informal economy. And you can see how it looks like a blameless situation. But in reality, what's happening is you're creating a parallel structure. And that parallel structure has the capacity at some point to overwhelm the formal structure if it gets too powerful. You've seen that happening in some countries with, say, the Catholic Church. Right? The Catholic Church comes into a country that is totally, that might be totally corrupt. You know, aid, international aid, has to be sent into the country. And, you know, it's, you're, and, and in some cases, the people that are, that are giving the aid will trust the, you know, the local priest to distribute that aid rather than the local government. 
and just like that, you've got, you know, all kinds of political issues. You've got foreign interference. You've got just a ton of problems, potentially. And all this comes from this desire to be charitable. But if it's part of an organization that, or part of a structure that allows money laundering, you know, you've got potential problems. And what, what does this have to do with work ethic? What does this have to do with culture? So if you're able to not work because wages are so low, and one of the reasons wages are very low in your, in your district is because you don't have an honest banking system, which means you can't have an honest insurance system, where suddenly charity becomes a business. It suddenly becomes easier to look to solicit donations and to create marketing, like propaganda, video, media, soliciting donations from so-called developed countries or rich countries. In part, you know, whether the, you know, relying on all, all sorts of factors, not just guilt over the colonial past. But again, this intricate network of, you know, let me, wait. Let me wait a bit. I'm, I'm over the highway or freeway. So suddenly, you, know, you have all these issues coming in. And, you know, when I, I actually happen, I'm, I'm giving that Tebow example because I happened to go to what looked like a children's hospital in the Philippines that had Tim Tebow's name on it. And when I got there, you know, you had, and remember the Philippines speaks, people speak English. Of course, in some areas they may still speak Tagalog because the colonial, colonial powers, you know, usually when they come in to occupy a country, they may not necessarily occupy the whole country. It's expensive. And, you know, what you're really trying to do is extract resources or figure out a way to create a beachhead of some sort that, you know, allows you to, to export your financial system, your legal system, and so on. And that usually involves a capital city as opposed to farmland. Um, with the Soviet Union, of course, they sort of figured this out and they tried to nationalize the farming sector. And that was in some ways a failure that unraveled the entire Soviet Union eventually. It was called collectivization of farming. Uh, so that's, that was something I think Brezhev criticized later on, along with what was what he called the cult of personality. So with respect to this incident, so I, I walked in and I saw a kid in the bed, very simple surroundings. And, you know, just what appeared to be pretending to be mad. He was, looked like he had been trained to hit himself in the head. And it's very hard, right? It's very hard to separate the mad from the sane, especially these days, and especially for anyone who's familiar with Lewis Carroll. But it did look to me that whenever somebody would come in from the outside, that this institution would be given a heads up. And then essentially the equivalent of child actors would be assigned to the beds, would not say anything. I mean, no English at all. And would just sort of, you know, behave in a depraved manner so that somebody could then go back and say what a wonderful man Tebow is for taking care of these children and so on and so forth. You may say I'm a cynic, but this isn't the only example. I've been to another country where I look on Google Maps, says over here there's a cafe, it's open from this date, from this time to this time, drive by there many times, and these are again small, you know, small, when you're talking about a cafe, we're not talking about a Starbucks, typically. The farther out you go from capital cities or major cities. We're talking about some sort of makeshift, you know, maybe even, you know, a place, especially in Vietnam, maybe somebody, you know, some, just a, a cart outside somebody's house in South Vietnam, not necessarily North Vietnam, which is more developed uh, for what should be obvious reasons. So, drive by, back and forth, and then, turns out there's no one, there's a sign that says maybe Kopi or coffee. There's no one manning the station. There's no employees, there's no owner. You look at this and you wonder if somebody is financing this organization, and you start to realize that it's a broad issue because you go down and you see another coffee shop, and this coffee shop, again, is not staffed properly, or at least consistently. And so you start to realize, well, maybe this is a coordinated effort. You attract investment dollars, 
somebody gets a ride off somewhere or at least a good feeling and suddenly you've got a bunch of people that are, that are dependent on foreign aid in a way that undermines domestic governments which are also in a way dependent on foreign countries even post-colonial uh, colonialism because they still have to buy essential items like oil in the in the US dollar which means they have to have a line of credit uh, that allows them access in many cases cases because they haven't invested in their own bank, banking system they have to put their money in an account that's supervised by the Federal Reserve uh, and so you know that that means they have an account in the United States so <clears throat> you look at all these things together and you understand that if you create a system that is post-colonial in name only, while the financial system that underpins globalization is still the same, is still essentially a colonial system, the cultures will be different and the work ethic will be different because you've allowed so many loopholes to potentially subvert a developing country's ascent to from third world to first world. And that is of course, that, that phrase is borrowed from Singapore, which was in fact a small third world country that became perhaps the most successful country in the world uh, from you know 1945 all the way up until today. So that's something to think about when, you, when we think about culture and we think about work ethic, when we think, when we think about charity, <laughs> You know, when you travel, you know, the idea is to create a system where you really understand what the world that you live in. And not only that you understand it, but you try to create a, a piece of history that allows other people to reach back and access it, at least your perspective, so that you can, you know, prevent people in the future from essentially whitewashing history or subverting it for their own purposes and that's one of the things that I've tried to do here and I hope it helps and I still don't know if I'm if I'm allowed as a business as a DBA to wear the logos of other companies uh, so I'll just say I tried to, to look it up I didn't find an answer but I'll just say again that I'm not sponsored by anyone this video is not sponsored by anyone it is not sponsored by the Golden State Warriors or by Nike Hopefully I'll get an answer sometime uh, about wh what happens because I don't know how to block out these logos. I see sometimes that people block them out, but I don't know how to do that. So here we are, just trying to get a small business off the ground. And I'm, I am looking for sponsors. If you, you know, in, in the same sense as radio, if you want me to mention your product to be at the beginning, you know, let me know. And that's all I have for today.